Well, we're going to be talking about some new and emerging threats that we're seeing facing different industries today. Um, kind of go through some in-depth analysis of some of the malware that we've been analyzing. Uh, go through a couple of uh, POS attacks, plus not that we haven't been beat to death on POS over the last two months, but we'll go in depth on a couple of uh, attack vectors that are being used. And then we're going to end it with a nice little new uh, Linux uh, credential stealing attack that's taking place. So let's get started. So let's do a 2013 in review. So what's happened in 2013? We saw the introduction of kind of the internet of things. I actually had uh, one of my researchers who did a uh, talk at DEF CON last year, which was uh, weaponizing your coffee pot. Um, and then he also is actually currently working on compromising the Nest uh, thermostat, uh, which is actually an interesting thing because it actually interacts with the cloud. So uh, being able to compromise that type of information um, is really interesting, especially with the Nest because it um, senses when you're around. It basically, the way the Nest works is as you walk into a house, it senses that there's movement and it turns up the temperature, turns down the temperature based on if anybody's occupying the house. What a great way for somebody who's going to rob your house to determine if anybody's in the house first. So um, interesting research coming out of the Internet of Things. Healthcare. Healthcare's been uh, beating the crap this year. I mean, they've been getting hit left and right by different... Um, Breaches taking place, patient information, doctors, credit cards, pharmaceuticals. Uh, we were looking at some data just last week about um, results of CAT scans and things like that that are out floating around the internet today. JP Morgan, you know, they got hit. Of course, uh, hundreds of thousands of individuals, usernames, passwords, um, credit card data. A lot of that got released out there. Evernote. Now, Evernote, I think, is an interesting breach just because of the way Evernote works. For those that don't know Evernote, Evernote's actually an awesome product. It's a way for you to keep notes across multiple platforms. So if you use a, an iPad or your iPhone or you use a, your computer system, you can take notes in a meeting. It will go ahead and sync across and um, just be able to sync all the notes that you take. Now, an interesting thing about that is a lot of system administrators use put in usernames and passwords inside those notes so that they don't have to remember different login credentials into different systems. So Evernote I thought was a very brilliant breach um, just because of the amount of data that they can get on individual companies as far as logins or just general information. Now we got social media, you know, Facebook, Google, Yahoo, LinkedIn, a um, lot of social media taking place. Um, social media, I really attribute a lot of the social media play to that's where a hacker really starts gaining information before he launches an attack on an actual company or individual. So uh, say there's a data breach in an organization or I want to target uh, company XYZ. I'm going to go into LinkedIn, look up all the employees that work for company XYZ. Then I'm going to go get the uh, username, password, usually it's their corporate email address. Then I'm going to try to sync it across social media platforms. So I'm going to go get their LinkedIn information. I'm going to go get their Facebook information, their MySpace, uh, Twitter accounts. I'm going to grab those passwords and I'm going to correlate the passwords. If, and, and if we've learned anything as security professionals, it's that our users are lazy by nature. They like to use the same or same variation of a password. So if I was able to determine a password through correlating passwords across social media platforms, it's probably a very good idea for me to go to Outlook Web Access for that company, put the username, the email address, and then start brute forcing the password to all the variations that could possibly be until I eventually get in. And as an attacker, that means I'd now throw those credentials and password in the sale pile um, that I'm going to put out in the market. Bit9, another brilliant one. That was actually from 2012, but I like to show the sophistication. These ha attackers, malicious actors out there, are really understanding what we as security professionals are doing and using to protect our environments. So they broke into uh, Bit9, this is kind of old news, but they went in and they actually stole some of the certificates that they use to actually certify applications that go in and out of a customer's environment. Now what they did is they used these certif certificates and actually certified their malware. So as soon as the malware came into a Bit9 customer, the appliance said, hey, this is legitimate traffic, let it right through the front door. 
Um, Adobe, Adobe Breach. Everybody saw this one. I mean, there was hundreds of millions of usernames, passwords, but what's interesting about with this was the password hints. Um, and going through the data dump was very um, kind of entertaining because we saw lots of things like my, uh, my childhood hero, um, my favorite football team. These are all things you could find out about a person in social media. Um, so now I now have an idea what their password in their corporate space might be. <coughs> uh, Living Social, again, another social media platform. Another place where you can go ahead and correlate more password data. And of course, Target. Everybody's been talking about Target since uh, December. So I'm not going to get too much into it because we all know if you got a notice from your bank, you know you're on the list. But what I will go into is let's talk about some of the malware that's involved. But before we get into that, let's talk about our old friends, Anonymous. So Anonymous was really active back in 2010, 2011. But over the last two years, we've seen these guys really fall off the wayside. Um, last year, they launched a bunch of operations against financial companies, oil, gas, and energy. Um, but guess what? They didn't get a lot of participation from their followers because a lot of their talented followers have moved on and created their own groups. Um, the only thing you're left with anonymous is about two and a half million script kiddies and kind of, um, not saying there's not a few talented guys out there, but a lot of the talented guys that want to do a lot of malicious activity have already left that space. So that puts us into kind of the splinter cells that have been created. So we have Noel Crew, Ghost Shell, Bangladesh Army, uh, Info Antisec. Now, Noel Crew and Ghost Shell, those guys you've seen a lot going after a lot of, you know, government, healthcare, financial. Um, Ghost Shell came on the market in 2012 in December, releasing about 1.4 million usernames, passwords uh, to various. They went after everybody. They were indiscriminately just attacking everyone and released everything. Now Team Berserk, these guys are probably one of the most talented groups that are out there today. These guys, um, their whole purpose in life is to embarrass the government. So they were actually uh, just posted a YouTube video about a month ago where they were um, basically having internal communication between their group and they caught a Fed in listening on the conversation. So what did they do? They started recording it. They posted it all on YouTube where they started calling them out, calling, asking questions, quizzing them, and just, just for the sheer embarrassment of embarrassing them. Not only him, but the federal government. Um, they just recently, last month, hit DHS, where they went and uh, stole a bunch of classified, non-classified, top secret documentation. Um, they also have been bro breaking into uh, um, court systems. They released a lot of information about judges, payrolls, uh, payments to certain individuals, uh, confidential informant payments. Uh, so they've been releasing a lot of interesting data out there over the last year. Uh, Team Vendetta, um, these guys are, um, they're all about smoking weed. That's, there's no other way around it. These guys go after like FDA, uh, they go after the DEA, uh, they go after individuals in states, federal government who are doing anti-marijuana uh, legislation. Um, but that's kind of their focus. I mean, uh, Anon Brazil, uh, another decent group, fairly talented, um, really poor communication though between their followers. So um, late last year, uh, due to the whole Syrian uprising and all that, they decided they were going to jump on the political bandwagon. So they were going to go out to the NSA website. They put together this big plan. They were talking about their underground forum where they were going to go ahead and hit the NSA and deface all the websites with all this Syrian slogan stuff. So, day comes to the attack, what do they hit? They hit NASA. They hit the freaking wrong site. So instead of NSA, they hit NASA, defaced a lot of their intranet sites, uh, put all their Syrian slogans up there. Um, even recently, these guys just released some really cool pieces of code to launch against some banking institutions. Again, they hit the wrong banks. Um, so, I mean, these guys are talented guys they just need to work on their communication. Um, Level 7 crew, actually, um, Level 7 crew was actually back around my day, back in the late 80s, early 90s, where a um, bunch of talented guys doing a lot of things just for fun. Well, somebody this year just revived the crew in uh, March of uh, 2013, and they just started launching some attacks, 
again, usernames, passwords, that type of stuff. Um, Wunan Girls, Raven, uh, these are all talented groups. These, these are um, female hacking groups. They tend to go after uh, people who um, spend a lot of time in the Middle East, going after uh, governments who violate women's rights, or if, um, you know, with all the um, healthcare stuff, they've been going after healthcare providers, senators, anything that ha anybody has against uh, any type of women's rights thing. So, I mean, these, these girls are actually really good at what they do. Uh, somebody that's not up here that we should probably talk about is the Syrian Electronic Army. Because everybody's been seeing how they've been compromising social media, um, doing a lot of Twitter, DNS hijacking. Um, but looking at these guys a few years ago, these guys started off as the Syrian Computer Club. They were just a bunch of computer enthusiasts who would um, turn political and started defacing government websites based on politics. And they've kind of started growing their skill level where now they're doing DNS hijacking. They're going after mainstream media. So um, I'm actually expecting to see a lot more from these guys because what started off as a bunch of computer enthusiasts a few years ago, those guys have really built their talents and their crew up quite a bit. So it's a lot of good information that we're seeing out there. So let's talk about Captoxa since that's what everybody's been talking about over the last month. Um, this was kind of the POS malware that hit target. Um, we did a full in-depth analysis on this, um, where basically, you know, it came through, disabled firewalls, infected the POS system, scraped the memory, uh, saved the data locally, sent it off-site through an enabled share, then sent it off uh, via FTP. So some of the attack pieces that we saw that we, uh, as we were running this malware at, we actually went through and purchased this malware um, from Re, uh, who was the actual author of the original piece of malware before it got uh, weaponized by Captoxa. Um, but we went through and we were actually able to launch it. And as you can see here, it launches a service, but it launches so fast we were unable to catch the text here in the box that takes place. But as soon as it launches, it goes ahead and adds up that POSWS service and it sets it up as a regular user. But it, if the um, system is configured incorrectly, as this one was, it also was listed under administrative privileges. Then it sets up the next net.exe share, uh, where basically it set up a SMB share between um, the actual individual devices and a centralized server. Um, then it goes through and creates the back door, where basically it does a task kill. Now, everybody has been talking about the BMC piece of this, how they were using the Blade Logic software as this. So, this bladelogic.exe actually does not exist. But what they did is they basically did a, a task kill to make sure that that wasn't running in the background and it reestablished the net, uh, reestablished the service under uh, using malicious, using that malicious SMB share. Then, as you can see, it saves all the files locally to a .dll file. Then it went through and sends it off-site to a centralized uh, server, uh, which is one of the ways we think that the actual malware got inside is because the way POS systems work is that there's a centralized master server in the corporate headquarters that pushes updates to regional servers inside the actual stores, which then push it down to the end POS system. So the most brilliant way to do this would be able to push your malware in there as an actual service update for it to propagate as quickly as it did. And then as you can see here, it basically sends the data off-site using those, that IP address, the username, the password, sent it to the XE bin file, and then sent the text file. Um, basically a command line version of it. So some of the ways to mitigate this, of course, you look through your POS systems, you look for auto run keys, uh, user profiles, disabling FTP, access control lists. I mean, DLP products would have done a good job picking this kind of thing up. Um, you know, not allows, you know, software that doesn't need local rights or policies to process data, um, and definitely have an exclusion list of black of blacklisted executables that can run. But a good way to find this would have been through log detection, because this log detection, you can actually find when the, that POSWDS service gets initiated, which means if you would have found this out through a log message, you would have been able to find out the first level of infection before exfiltrate, data started getting exfiltrated out of that site. Again, threat manager signatures um, through the IDS, there's about 10 signatures that are floating around on the net right now that are used everything from the initial communication to the establishment of FSMB shares, communication to the C2s, 
as well as uh, just generalized FTP connection using the naming convention that they used as part of the transfer of data. Now, Captoxa is really a, a basis of uh, Dexter. So anybody in the retail space, this is going to be a very long year for anybody in retail this year for the very reason that if this is going to have anything like uh, Dexter did, this thing hit over 40 different countries. 42% of the infections were in North America, all hitting the, kind of the same attack vector. So I would expect to continue to see this more and more throughout this year. So, I mean, it's going to be a long year for retailers. But there's also a new variant that came out, the Chewbacca POS malware. This one is not as sophisticated as Captoxa, but this thing is just as effective. It does screen scrapes. Um, it compromises credentials. So some of the things we saw over here is it started an executable into the user directory. It then put hooks on the keyboard where it starts doing key logging. So now you start getting usernames, passwords. It sets up um, um, the network connection. It does the memory scraping. But what's interesting is it actually deletes the original infection um, after it's infected a workstation, making it pretty hard to find within the environment. This particular piece of code has been um, hitting the um, hospitality industry. So far it's hit Marriott, Hilton, uh, Holiday Inn, uh, Wolf Lodge. I mean, quite a list of uh, hotel chains that's been hitting. Uh, and I'm sure we're gonna continue to see this. So again, another piece of POS malware that we're seeing hit. It does a sleep timer, it does registry edits. So it sleeps in between processes, you know, which makes it very hard to detect within an environment with your average POS environment. But again, um, there it is setting up the uh, network connection so it can go ahead and send off data off site. And of course, this is sitting in a hosting provider in Amsterdam, um, which is uh, where a lot of malicious activity flows through. But the, tra the actual root of where it came from is out of France. So it's an interesting piece as far as this piece of malware that we were able to um, exfiltrate and purchase from some underground resources um, where we were able to reverse engineer it and analyze it. So there is detection we can do for it. There are some log management solutions. Um, there's also some threat signatures that you can put in place to detect this type of malware within your environment. Now let's talk about eBerry. eBerry's, we've been si traditionally seeing a lot of malware that has been focused around uh, Windows operating systems because that's what the majority of the world uses. Um, in fact, with that Chewbacca piece of malware, an interesting thing we saw on it is when we were running it through our sandbox, it didn't activate on virtual environments, but when we ran it through variations of Windows platforms, it only launched on uh, Windows XP um, SP2. If you had SP3, it didn't launch. If you were running Windows 7, it didn't launch. So it's very detected and very focused. So traditionally we've seen a lot of malware, but now we're starting to see, just as of recent, a lot of malware that's hitting iOS, that's hitting um, Mac OS. And then we're also seeing eBerry, which is probably one of the most recent ones hitting Linux. So as you can see, it has a lot of hook functions where it pulls a lot of the logging. What's an interesting piece of this is it actually reconfigures the logs to not detect the exploit. So when the exploit's running, there's no log messages being generated from those certain processes. So as you can see, it checks for host access, connection, syslog, um, uh, the write, the popen, um, host access. Um, it modifies source code. Um, you know, it basically sets up patches for uh, redirect call instructions. And as it's doing all these redirect calls, none of this is logging. So it intercepts a lot of segment faults. But what's really interesting about this is the data that it's trying to collect because it does establish an open SSH backdoor where it sends specific data over to SSH protocol. Um, it sets a version number with a hex string. It embeds an 11 character password, uh, flags intrusion detection. So when it's doing its initial uh, infection of environment, it actually scans and can actually detect if there's some type of intrusion detection sensor uh, device that's actually trying to pick up the data that it's sending. It's stealing passwords. Um, either a successful login, encrypted, non-encrypted. Um, it also collects username and password from any failed logins. So even if the password login wasn't successful, it's still pulling the data. It picks up the private key passphrases, which a lot of us have relied on, especially within the Linux platform, to, to keep us secure. Picks up the unencrypted private keys, as well as the private keys that are loaded to the SS OpenSSH client. So 
WeLiveSecurity.com actually did a great write-up on this. So um, if you're interested in the Linux um, uh, piece of malware um, as far as eBerry, um, there's a great write-up out there that these guys did on this. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your time, and we tweet and blog regularly, so thanks. Thank you.